we are going to have uh, 12 minutes for each of uh, uh, of you to present your 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 opinions and your knowledge. I will be the, the moderator of this panel. Uh, I am Sergio Sanchez. I come from Chile, 13 kilometers away. It's a very uh, far, far away country. Uh, I come here because I believe this political space is very important for the discussion uh, we're going to face forward. Uh, we, I believe that uh, a little commentary is needed uh, at first about yesterday recommendations of the Committee of Experts of the WHO. They put synthetic cannabinoids in Schedule 2. They keep under surveillance travel and pregabalin. Uh, they ask for more time to talk about cannabis plant and CBD, which is preoccupant for me because they, in the preliminary report, they say that it could be possible to move CBD to list 4 and cannabis plant also to schedule in list of uh, less uh, surveillance. What that it means in terms of harm reduction, I ask you also. Uh, they are asking themselves if there will be a good idea to do or not to do it. If they move the plant or the CBD, they facilitate and they create a market for the cannabis industry easier because less regulation will be afforded. Uh, if they refuse to do it, the sanction against people condemned for minor drug offenses against uh, the drug law must wait for better conditions to set them free. So it's a human rights affair. Here we mix it. the industry labor with the human rights vision. That's why it's so hard, I believe, to discuss this thing in an ethical framework, as they say in the, in the morning round table. So we need to ask ourselves, what can we do? Uh, where do we have to do advocacy or lobby activities? At CND, at the Experts Committee, uh, in our own countries? Uh, it's, those are just reflections for you. Um, the, or the organization asked me to be like a devil's advocate because uh, it is uh, interesting for all the industry and all the politicians and people to know that uh, not, uh, not at all in cannabis affairs are just uh, honey and, and, and chocolate, you know. There are a lot of problems that we need to be discussed. For example, for me, the major problem in drug use is the law and its different consequences or negative externalities. Black markets, higher prices, less quality, people offending law and disproportionality of the penalties, increasing amounts of money to pay for justice processes and jails, and the cost opportunity of keep people incarcerated instead of let them to work. These of them are for recreational use of cannabis. All of these are arguments for a change in policy now. On the other hand, you can think that drug policy have been designed since its origins in the 60s as a tool for internal control procedures to keep internal security in the same way that the terrorist law in order to protect the state, as conceived now and since the French Revolution. Despite the law, the people use cannabis. In my country, Chile, after 28 years of drug policy commanded under the idea of restriction, more people than ever consume cannabis. Last week, a study shows 34% of the young people use cannabis in Chile. It's a big market. Being the third country in the American region, just after Canada and the States. Otherwise, a lot of people claim that cannabis causes harm. 
They talk a lot about different effects to know a scale up theory, which actually is not a curated judgment. Not at all people that uses cannabis go forward cocaine. It seems in any case that the first drug to be used by youth are alcohol and tobacco, licit drugs that nobody cares about. I don't know, nobody recommended uh, there to the children, yet a lot of care and preventions in order not to regulate are being made because it could be the damage our children. In the discussion are also schizophrenia related issues that cannabis can or cannot cause it. You can also find arguments in one sense or another, but in the practice, you don't find at all people smoking cannabis with schizophrenia or psychosis. They also talk about IQ decreases studies. One that my compatriot, Anneliese Dörr, shows association between use of cannabis and IQ in children. Chilean children, showing that cannabis consumed causes low IQ and lower possibilities in life. Uh, we need to ask ourselves also about the possibilities of the word dependence. What do you think about dependence in cannabis? Also, there are effects of cannabis in memory. For me, it's hard to distinguish if they are talking of lack of memory effects under the influence of the plant, or if a long-term harms they are talking about. Obviously, other harms, which are harms we like more, are the prohibition-related, stigma and repression harms, people incarcerated for minor offenses related to drug laws. A lot of discussion must be made to finish this debate. For now, let's hear these three different visions. First of all, Michelle Thyssen. She's a Banyard Scholar and doctoral student in clinical psychology at the University of British Columbia, where she conducts research on cannabis use and mental health. She currently serves as a, the vice chair of the student-led organization Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Then we have uh, Oscar Pérez, who has a degree, Oscar, who has a degree in philosophy and anthropology and a master's degree in drug addiction for the University of Barcelona. He's a founding member of the Drug Policy Unit at the Universitat Autónoma de Bella Terra. Currently, in his role as deputy director of ICERS Foundation, Oscar promotes educational projects, drug reform and research in the cannabis social clubs, and is the coordinator of the World Conference of Ayahuasca. And finally, Dr. Oliver Bertrand, general practitioner, member of the Coordination Hemp and Liberties and active in the Health and Prevention Commission, Cannabis or medical marijuana has a key role to play in the public health for him. All right, so I, I would like to invite Michelle to, to speak. She has 12 minutes. Great, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so, as was said, I'm a clinical psychology student um, from Canada, a PhD student, and I'm also the vice chair of Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy. So we're a student-led organization that works on local, national, and international levels to promote sensible drug policy, increase harm reduction awareness, and disseminate um, evidence-based educational resources. So I just wanted to declare first off that I am a paid research assistant by a Canadian licensed producer, 
and CSSDP has received some funding from industry. Um, both of these um, sources of funds that we've received, we've really had to had no other choice. Uh, there isn't a lot of funding for this type of work, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, and both of these funds were done in a way that um, limits any sort of bias to our work. So this may not come as a shock to many here, but young people use drugs and they use cannabis. Uh, about 50% of Canadian youth uh, report using cannabis in the past year, and this is twice as high as the rest of the adult population aged 25 years and older. Um, so even though cannabis has been illegal up until the last couple of months and done so um, in large part to prevent use, uh, youth, youth by youth, youth, use by youth, um, it hasn't worked. Uh, we're using a lot of cannabis. So clearly prohibition has um, been a big failure. So with this high rate of use, we also see youth being disproportionately criminalized um, for their cannabis use. We see over 80% of um, crimes of drug-related offenses being related to simple cannabis possession. So that's 80% of the crimes, the drug-related crimes that those aged 12 to 24 experience being related to simply possessing cannabis for personal use. So although we talk about um, keeping cannabis uh, legal to protect young people, we actually see that it's having the opposite effect um, because criminalization is easily the single biggest harm um, related to adolescent cannabis use. And that's because having a criminal record can be detrimental to a young person's future from preventing them from holding certain jobs, losing financial aid, being expelled from school, and being denied housing. And unfortunately, um, youth are disproportionately affected, but within that, the people of color, uh, gender and sexual minorities um, are even further marginalized. So time and again, we hear that we are keeping cannabis illegal. Um, we're scheduling it to protect the young brains, developing brains. Um, you know, we hear things um, that using cannabis before age 25 is going to permanently change your brain structure. While a lot of research shows that young people are actually using cannabis for many of the same reasons that adults use it, for things like anxiety, to help with their sleep, to help with their pain. And so it's not as straightforward as I think we're led to believe. We need to listen to young people and ask them why they're using cannabis. When we talk to young people about using cannabis for medical purposes, they say that they, uh, they tried accessing traditional therapies from their physician and it was ineffective or the side effects weren't tolerable. So what we can do is we can use um, youth cannabis use for these purposes as sort of a jumping off point for conversations around their use. So perhaps by being open about the potential that cannabis is helping someone uh, with their medical problem, then we can start to address that medical problem. So rather than just saying like, you're just using it because you want to get high, we can instead invite a conversation and then start to maybe, if they're using it for things like sleep, we can open up a discussion around sleep hygiene that they could use in lieu of or in conjunction with their cannabis. The other problem that young people face is, um, again, being accused of their medical cannabis use, uh, it's recreational use under the guise of medical use. And part of this is because it's not treated the same by many of the um, services that young people access. So our group, um, Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy, uh, we found that in some cases students were using cannabis for medical purposes, paying into their student health plan, but then not being able to have that cannabis covered by the health plan they were paying into. So they were almost being incentivized to use medications that weren't um, tolerable or helpful for them, like benzodiazepines or antidepressants. 
So we started to advocate for um, the inclusion of medical cannabis into the student health plan. And of course, um, uh, you may have heard Jonathan Zaid up here earlier, so he really uh, spearheaded this in Canada and he helped our group um, get some similar coverage at a university in Canada. And this is just one small way that we can start to legitimize this option um, among young people. Now, of course, people also use cannabis because it's fun. Um, people report using it uh, for pleasure, for mind expansion. And that is now legitimate in Canada um, as of a couple months ago. So again, we seem to make it okay that young people are using alcohol. We have bars on our campuses. We have, um, you know, you can purchase cigarettes on some campuses, things like that. But instead, um, we're not allowing the use of cannabis on most campuses. There's only a couple campuses in Canada that allow that. And when we asked young people, this is some of um, the research that our group has done at UBC, when using cannabis, how does it affect your alcohol use? And we actually found that they report drinking less alcohol, almost 50% report drinking less. Um, over a third say they don't even want alcohol. And 40% said that they um, intentionally substitute their uh, cannabis or their alcohol with cannabis. So Canadian youth often also report uh, that cannabis to them is safer than alcohol. Uh, but of course, um, the policies that we have in place don't support this type of, of use by young people. So with all that cannabis use, uh, you would hope that we'd be educating young people how to use it safely or more safely, uh, but that really hasn't been the case. So the dominant practice since the 1960s has been um, to instill fear regarding drug use, that if you use it, something terribly wrong is going to happen, or that the people who use it are criminals. So this really presents a dichotomy that um, is false, that there's, there's no spectrum of use in the middle. You either use it, um, and if you do, then it's a problem, or you don't use it, and then um, you're somehow you know, morally enriched. So we, uh, we really, our group is about showing a full spectrum of, of users, um, from those that choose not to, to those that, that do so. And unfortunately, this type of education creates a lot of distrust between young people and adults. So I know for myself, um, you know, a police officer came into my classroom and told me all about the harms of cannabis use. And it took a really long time for me to uh, be able to trust um, the, the law again and, and police officers. And so if you've used cannabis and it hasn't had some sort of negative effect on your life, then it's going to be really hard to believe the things that these educators are telling. So this is where harm reduction comes in, and it's still, especially at the level of the UN, is uh, almost a swear word. Um, but what harm reduction does is it addresses the needs of young people who might already be using. Um, and just like with our sex education, as we've seen with research, teaching someone how to safely do something that they're going to do anyways doesn't encourage or increase the rates um, of that activity. It just keeps it safer. And it's, if we see 50% of youth having used cannabis, then perhaps this is an important thing to do. So we uh, consulted, uh, or consulted, uh, that's probably too fancy of a word, we got together with a bunch of our friends um, and invited other youth from various groups to ask them what they wanted to see, what was missing, what did, what did we need to know about cannabis. And we put together a sensible cannabis education toolkit. So. Uh, it's about a 100-page document. Uh, it's a little bit thick, but it's broken up into a bunch of little pieces. Um, there's a big section on harm reduction, and we were one of the only drug education toolkits that came out um, around the time of legalization that actually had this component. So it's something that's really absent from a lot of education in Canada, um, and, and likely globally. It also has curriculum for parents, so how to have these conversations. Young people see the world differently than adults, and so, uh, you know, adults need a little bit of education for how to have those conversations um, with their young people in a way that's non-biased and isn't going to close the, the door for more conversation. 
Some other things that our group has been doing is um, recognizing that our universities weren't prepared or weren't equipping students for legalization. So we, you know, we try as best as we can to forge relationships with administrators. Um, and we, you know, there was no consultations prior to legalization on what the cannabis policies were going to be on our campuses. So we convened some uh, groups ourselves and we put in some recommendations to administrators and we actually saw that they um, listened to us, surprised, and we actually have cannabis friendly outdoor smoking areas um, on one of our campuses, which was something that we really emphasized the need for. And finally, um, just want to really put out there that we need to be meaningfully included in conversations at the campus level all the way to the national and international level. So if there's university administrators in here, if there's professors in here, um, industry professionals, invite youth and listen to what they have to say because they are a large um, you know, demographic who, who has a diverse set of experiences. So when it comes to prevention um, and harm reduction, I think it's really important that we're consulted. Thank you. Okay. So I ask you, Oscar. Thank you uh, to the organizers for this opportunity, and thank you to all the public for being here. Uh, I've been asked to share my, my views in regards to topics of this panel. So as I have a short time, I will go a bit fast, but maybe then we have some time for the discussion if something is uh, more about your, your interest. So the first topic, it's more a reflexive topic. It, it has to see with the propagandistic cannabis use related harms. And the second topic is more um, concrete. It's more uh, about sharing the findings of our research and some research that has been done in the environment of the cannabis social clubs in Spain and to show that them work as a risk reduction strategy. So regarding the first uh, topic, the propagandistic cannabis use related harms, I want to share uh, a project that has, I've been involved for a couple of years in Spain. This is a, a group of experts that during those two years we have been developing a book, a book that has uh, two parts. And the first part is one analysis of the impacts of the current legality in Spain regarding cannabis, which is a penal prosecution of cannabis. So we try to assess from different perspectives uh, what are the impacts and the outcomes of the current non-legalization in Spain. And concretely, my colleague Jose Carlos Bouso and I, we wrote the third chapter, which is more or less the, the thing that has been asked to, to share today, which is the contextualization of the socio-sanitary impacts of cannabis use in Spain. The second part of the book was one law proposal for Spain taking account the reality of Spain and always defending a, a fully regularization of cannabis. So this is maybe might interest you. you. You have the website, one part of the website also in English, but it's a model that maybe some countries could also uh, try to, to push forward because it's very interesting when a group of experts which are not directly related to the cannabis social movement, even though we have a lot of uh, connections with them, propose uh, one law for the whole society. So it's not a law uh, directly built for the interest of the growers or the cannabis social clubs. It's one law that tries to be and gather consensus from the whole society, uh, in the Spanish society in, in this side. So um, our chapter tried to analyze uh, seven impacts of the, of the current legality in Spain. 
Um, but first I want to do a, a small introduction because why we always ended up with those um, risks. No? We are facing, when we try to speak about legalization, always the prohibitionist mainly, or even though uh, people, for example, who is in favor of legalizing cannabis can be very prohibitionist with our substances, and then uh, cannabis is okay because it's natural, but uh, methamphetamine is good because it's, it's dangerous. So somehow, uh, what I wanted to point is that the prohibition of drugs, it has not uh, succeeded in stopping the offer or the demand of drugs. But it has really succeeded in um, creating a lot of myths, myth conception, and a mix of objective and non-objective uh, information. They're somehow creating false debates which contain some true, uh, true but uh, that stop us to go to the, really to the focus of the, of the problem. That at the end is that the prohibition is a, a big business. It's based on a moral perspective and it's a very racist uh, policy. But this is something that it's difficult to arrive to discuss because then they put your first this on, on the face and you have to, to discuss it. What I wanted to say is that prohibition uh, what, what it's very successful because it operates like a discourse. A discourse is um, we, we have incorporated lots of discourse in ourselves. No, we live in a sociocultural network, and for example, prohibition is very similar to racism or to homophobia. Okay, these are discourse that operate and circulate all through us and that we all reproduce. For example, I can be, um, as I said. Uh, anti-prohibitionist with cannabis, but myself I can use the prohibitionist arguments to stop the debate about other legaliz legalization of other substances. So once that is said, and maybe later we want to speak or reflect more uh, about this, um, the, um, the, w that's why w we chose those seven topics because in Spain, the central government in 2006 and 2009 issued uh, clinical guides about cannabis, and this was a, a strategy to stop the debate of regulation. No, so those were the experts doing a clinical guide by the government, and they were speaking about all of these risks, no? like we cannot legalize or advance in the legalization uh, debate because we have to discuss about all of this. And as, as I said, as this was done by a prohibitionist uh, regime, it was always defending that this is uh, a very big problem. No? As a, I don't have much time, I cannot go inside all of them, so I picked two of them. One is the psychosis uh, issue, and the other one is a bit different. Uh, this is completely different, in fact, because fines, arrests, and crimes for prohibitionists are a solution to the problem. But as we have a multicultural, uh, multidisciplinary approach, uh, what we see is that fines, arrests, and crimes are in, uh, a problem of prohibition. So in the same chapter, we try to analyze which are the impacts of this solution, which at the end is a big problem. So regarding uh, psychosis, um, our chapter is a bit more large, but I, I go directly to the, to the point. Uh, in 2012, in Spain, the Spanish Society of Dual Pathology, which is a society um, which all the members are psychiatrics, very well connected to the big pharma, so they are not uh, suspicious of being anti-prohibitionist, issued some, uh, a book with a chapter dedicated to cannabis and psychosis, and those are those, the, their four conclusions. And they say that, uh, this, so this is evidence-based conclusions defended by the prohibitionist uh, psychiatric sector of, of the Spanish society. Cannabis use is not necessary or sufficient cause to cause psychotic, psychotic disorder. What it's true is that there's a significant relationship between consumption during adolescence and increased risk of developing psychosis, and this is dose dependent. dependent. So as much higher doses this uh, developing uh, brain takes, much risk is to, to by being diagno diagnosed by a schizophrenia. Then the third point, here, maybe it's familiar to us, but it's a complete uh, revolution for many doctors to realize that, in fact, CBD is antipsychotic. So then we cannot say that cannabis is, provokes psychosis because there's a compound which is uh, uh, the opposite. 
And then an uh, uh, interesting um, idea is that the reduction of cannabis use as primary prevention of schizophrenia is not an effective strategy. And I want to put some color with some data on this. And they, self, they, they said, even if we assume that there's a correlation between cannabis and, and psychosis, um, if cannabis consumption could be completely eliminated from society, only an 8% of the schizophrenia incidents would happen. Or for example, it would be necessary that 4,000 intensive cannabis users and 5,000 men and women of any type of use of cannabis stop using cannabis to prevent one single case of schizophrenia. So it's clear that it doesn't make much sense to make this attribution to cannabis and, and schizophrenia. So the causal relation, what we know, in fact, is the causal relation between cannabis and psychosis is very difficult because there's a lack of scientific evidence. Uh, one thing that operates in all this risk, or at least when they defend this risk, is that the concurrence of a phenomena does not imply causality. And this is what basically operates in all these myths. No? So uh, this is the... Um, la trampa, uh, como es? The... Um, the trickiness that they constantly use to, to confuse concurrence with causality. What we should better ask is if a punitive policy, policy reduces the incidence of a psychosis or if it increases the consumer stigmatization and how those people affected with mental health diagnosis and that takes cannabis deal with this double uh, stigma. No? What we conclude is that the regulation would protect those, would better protect those vulnerable groups and that punishment does not. So the other topic that I wanted to approach you is the one regarding the law enforcement. So in Spain, which is a 47 million country, uh, in 2013, 6.5 million identification happened. Of those, 400,000 ended with a sanction for consumption of possession of drugs on the public road, 87% of them for cannabis. So this is uh, 1,000 fines per day. This in 2017 represented a collection of 93 million for the state. And the typical profile that receives these fines is a man, a Spaniard, and between 19 and 25 years old. Uh, what we see is that this profile is the people who suffered more the economical crisis, so the people who has nothing to do and is on the street, and uh, who has no employment, and is also the people who has a higher rates of consumption. So we should ask if through the government, the best policy to interact with this group is by putting fines or, or uh, keeping their money. Regarding the arrest charge for drug trafficking, in, 2000, uh, in 2013, sorry, there were 2,000 per day in, in Spain. The typical profile is also a man, uh, Spanish, most of it, and in second, uh, Morocco. So what we reflect is that the public expenditure involved in investigating and prosecuting such large number of people is substantial as it is the impact of such experiences in their lives and the community that surrounds them. This is a topic that I, I know that uh, Americans know a lot because the social justice uh, problem of the legalization is very big and organizations like DPA have been doing a great job for the last years. And uh, One minute. Last, sorry? One minute. One minute. Okay, I won't go to prisons. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go directly to the cannabis social cloud findings. And regarding to the risk uh, problems, I want to show, uh, share with you a research that uh, some Czech colleagues did in Spain. This was a 17 focus group organizing cannabis social clubs. And they wanted to answer the question if such cannabis social clubs could minimize risk. Concretely, those four risks normally link to cannabis consumption. So regarding respiratory and other health risks, what they found is that cannabis social clubs are capable of assessing the pres presence of contaminant contaminants and adulterants. This does not alleviate the respiratory risk of consuming cannabis or smoking cannabis, but it significantly reduces the health risk to cannabis users resulting from unknown contaminants, molds, and adulterants. It's creepy. Uh, regarding mental health risk, what they conclude is that even the um, cannabis users in the study did not provide scientific accounts of reduction in mental health risk. Uh, they increased the level, level information of the types and effects of this cannabis, and this would allow them to better match their cannabis use with their desired psychic state or daily activity. 
and such capacity, uh, capability is an aspect of achieving mental health well-being. And the uh, last one is the risk of dependence. Uh, cannabis social club members have restrictions on the intake of cannabis that they can take every day, but they have it warranted at the same time because they know that next time they can get more. And this can lead to a reduction of consumption in some cannabis users. While, we, while this was not an overall effect reported by the members, it provides interesting and challenge to the future assessment of how different types of users and different personalities respond to restricted av availability of cannabis. And sorry, this is the last one regarding social risk. Uh, when members enter to the environment of a cannabis social club, which as you know is a common place, uh, this is a very potential role for uh, harm reduction strategies and to collaborate with administration. So cannabis social clubs offer a unique environment for this kind of education interventions. While many operate also as a cohesive social spaces, information disseminated to cannabis users can have important synergic effect achieved through informal social control. Okay, I will stop here and maybe in the discussion I can keep going. Dr. Olivier Bertrand. If someone can give me a translate apparat, please. Thank you. Hello, bonjour à tous. Merci, merci aux organisateurs pour cette très belle conférence à Vienne. Merci à tous, tous les gens qui sont présents. Donc, je vais vous présenter. Alors, je me présente déjà. Je suis médecin généraliste en France, addictologue. Je travaille bénévolement pour l'association Normal France perception euh, des médecins généralistes concernant l'alcool, le cannabis et le tabac. Donc ici, euh, en première diapo, je vous présente juste les sources bibliographiques et puis on va attaquer le sujet avec les, les chiffres clés. Le, can le cannabis, c'est 180 millions d'usagers à travers le monde, selon l'ONU. Euh, la well, du cannabis the... est... À, UN bien moindre à celle du tendency is far inferior to that to tobacco or alcohol according to a NESAC study done in Ireland and as far as we know nobody died of cannabis use and toxicity seems to be 114 times less than that of alcohol so the um, data regarding uh, damages uh, and uh, are studied by NUT in the United Kingdom, by Renault in France, where they evaluated the toxicity of various products, and they did that on an individual basis and on a societal basis. And what's interesting is that the results are, are similar. On both studies, the main uh, toxic product is alcohol. It... Uh, Deals lots of harm to individuals and to society. And cannabis in both uh, studies is, is around the middle, after heroin, alcohol, or tobacco, but at around the same level as amphetamines. So that may be shocking. Lots of people think that amphetamines are much more toxic than cannabis, but according to experts, French and British experts, uh, they are comparable. And here you have the results uh, of, um, of my thesis and, the, and compare them to Reno's work. And to understand, I mean, this thing about the harm uh, caused by cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco, and you see what the, the judgment of experts, what the GPs think, and what the population think, the general population. Uh, for Reno, you had 48 experts in the, in the, the, the GPs that's 978 GPs, general practitioners, 
and for the general population, it was 1,016 people who were questioned. So what you can see there, but the dot perception is a foul call. <clears throat> people just uh, have the same impression with the experts or physicians or uh, just a part of the drone population. They seem to think that the, the harm can be set at 48%. For cannabis, you see there is a huge difference uh, on the left, you, the, 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 the experts. And in the middle, the general practitioners, and uh, on the right, uh, the general population. And we do that for every single product, uh, cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco. And uh, blue is the individual harm, and uh, red is the societal harm. You see that for cannabis, the perception is much higher with the general population, but the health professionals, the general practitioners, situate it at around 27%. And that's what you see about the advantages, too. Uh, experts uh, are more positive regarding to cannabis than the GPs and uh, the, the general population. And uh, this, where does it come from? F f from a long time ago, because there has been some propaganda for quite a long time, uh, for, for over a century. And here you see some... Uh, uh, posters that were used during a uh, uh, prohibition campaign in the United States. Those uh, posters were done by a Frenchman, actually. And you see the, the, what the results can be of alcohol, I mean, murder, rape, whatever. And today, the, top, the thing is maybe a little more sensible, uh, not crazy as it used to be. But still, you have all those kind of prejudices. Uh, it is very often said that THC is neurotoxic, which is false. And uh, the THC cannabinoids are antioxidants, and they do protect the, the cells. They are neuroprotectors. And THC is not a neurotoxic, it's, it's a neuroprotector. And when you compare the smoke from a hemp cigarette and a tobacco cigarette, then you see that the components, uh, the toxic components uh, present in the, in the smoke, are um, comparable um, as far as the level of toxicity is concerned. So when you say that uh, cannabis smoke is five, five times more toxic than tobacco smoke, it, it's just false. And regarding schizophrenia, Degenhardt um, did a study that showed that there was no increase in the prevalence of schizophrenia, whereas the use of cannabis uh, uh, increased by a factor of three. So it doesn't lead to schizophrenia. Uh, actually, it's a multifactorial uh, illness, and cannabis is a very distant factor. And no study could prove that cannabis uh, led to the con use of other drugs. And uh, uh, actually, w today, people are finding out that uh, the cannabis enables a de-escalation. And um, did you have the anti-graving study uh, regarding CBD? And as Michel mentioned, what you can see that there's a substitution between products. And, uh, Cannabis could be a tool for reducing harm uh, for when people try to abstain from other uh, substances like alcohol, tobacco, or, and it's not officially used like this, but it might be something for the future. And, uh, and if 8.9% uh, of users were concerned, and addiction is strong, certainly, but... It's reversible, and all studies show that uh, it, that were done on psychiatric populations by Denikert, especially, uh, who mentioned the anti motivational syndrome. And the studies that were done were done on a psychiatric population, not on the general population. And uh, regarding uh, driving, there are lots of things could be said about that. But the studies um, couldn't show any great responsibility of cannabis regarding uh, fatal accidents. And it's, it's been proved that it's far less dangerous than alcohol. And, uh, and in many countries, uh, the penalties are just as high for cannabis use as for alcohol use, but it doesn't seem logical regarding the real circumstances. 
And as for secondary effects of cannabis, um, I used a meta-analysis done by JAMA. It dealt with the medical cannabis. And we are just going to talk about the active uh, principles, not the other risk factors, but what there are as risks that are related to the um, active factors. And usually they are due to an overdose of THC. And the, those fact, uh, effects can be limited with a gradual titration of THC, and they can also be limited if the substance is highly titrated in cannabidiol. And the second side effects are rather limited. Uh, you don't have any CB1 receptors in the respiratory system, so you can't have a problem with the respiratory system. And with regard to the titration in THC, the brain does synthesize a substance that will avoid any strong effects from THC to happen. And those effects, we know them. It's anxiety, hallucinations, and that's what the people would call a bad trip. And a bad trip, actually, it becomes stronger in the case of ingestion, because the liver will metabolize the THC, and the metabolite will then saturate for far longer the CB1 receptor, and the effect is therefore stronger, potenter. And the secondary effects are therefore limited, and limited to four sectors, and uh, concerns only 31% of patients in that study, which means that 70% uh, of the users uh, do not have any side effect. And when you have f side effects, they are focused on the four sectors, uh, neurological problems and psychiatric problems. Uh, now, um, the, the, main, um, the main damages linked to the active principles are rather limited, but there are other damages that are stronger, but are um, related to the way the pro substance is administered. Usually people use it as a cigarette or a joint, and that's a very bad way of administering it, because then that can lead to cardiovascular problems, respiratory disorders, cancers, and there are solutions. You can educate people to, to, to let them use other methods, uh, vaporization or sublingual administration, and the uh, damages that are linked to the way of method of administration, but also to the legal framework, because the, the, whether there is a regulation or not, but the situation will change. And in France, it's not regulated, and we have absolutely no sanitary control on the quality of the substances. We have no idea of the titration or the composition of the substance, and we have no uh, uh, idea about the risk reduction of the campaigns, and uh, we have no access to the data regarding risk reduction, and we can't really protect the youth. And actually, regarding the youth, uh, and what is being said about cannabis and their use by youth, um, it doesn't destroy any neurons. And what happens is not really negative, but it is reversible, that's true. Another important harm. Uh, um, and we have to, 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 to be aware of it. And uh, you have to understand that most users are not dependent. Uh, I said 8.9% are dependent. And only those who have a chronic use may d d become slightly dependent. But uh, dependency is a relation between an individual and a substance in a given social control context. And if we want to reduce the harm, we have to act on, on all factors. And uh, uh, the, 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 the question of the psychiatric harm and, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. 
and uh, the, the, the different um, factors uh, uh, of dependency are the individual ground, the uh, economical and cultural context, and the nature of the product. Although the risk reduction, what is it? It's a change of paradigm. You have to recognize that it is possible to use it sensibly and that uh, people should use uh, less harmful practices. And five pillars have been proposed. The, 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 we have to insist on the quality of the product. They use uh, things, safe routes of administration. Uh, you have to use microdosing. And there are quite a few programs that are being set uh, 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 currently. And then you have the set and setting pro uh, system. And there's something that would be very important too, would be to conform the law, to adapt, adjust the law according to the, the, the habits of people because the law does increase the harm much more so than cannabis itself. And I will just uh, mention that compared to alcohol, the social cost of cannabis is extremely low. And uh, surprisingly, the legal cost of cannabis is very high compared to alcohol. So it's something that's not very expensive to society as far as healthcare are concerned, but it's very expensive in the way of repression. And um, those, uh, the, 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 and you can see that. And to 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 end my speech, I will mention the experience of Bruce Alexander, who set a, a rat in a cage. You can look at that. You can see that on the internet. And if the cage is empty, and if you put some heroin and. Um, uh, and another thing where there is no heroin, then the, the, the rat will die fast because it will use the heroin. But if you have those two push buttons, and a, a rat will be there and will be able to play with lots of other rats. And uh, then in that case, <clears throat> if the rat has a choice between heroin and just water, the rat always uses the plain water. So what's important to reduce the harm? is to work much more on the environment, on the legal and social cultural context, than on the substance itself. <coughs> OK, thank you, Dr. Oliver. So it seems we have an agreement here. It seems also that uh, uh, extractions, you know, extractions, mechanical methods to, to make extractions of the plants are another harm reduction uh, point because it's safer to make it with this big press than uses alcohol or butane or another, another chemical method. So uh, I, I don't know if some one of you want to complement what the others say. Maybe it's a moment. Oh, another, oh, one question. Oscar asked me for a question more concrete. Uh, I would, I would like to ask uh, Oscar maybe, uh, what is the reality of the of dependence? of cannabis because in Chile a lot of physicians say that it causes a lot of dependence. It's a very dangerous thing about independence and addiction of cannabis. Well, what we saw on our chapter, we used the um, official indicators, socio-sanitary indicators, and what we saw is that this seems to increase. I mean, in Spain we had a huge problem with heroin use on the 80s. 80s and all the um, abuse indicators and all the intoxication indicators uh, fall down during the last 15 years. And the, on, the only one, alcohol is very high al always, but the one that is increasing in the last years is cannabis. So we were very surprised of how is it possible. We didn't really understood. And then what we look is how those indicators are built because uh, to detect the abuse of cannabis, they use a very simple questionnaire with six questions. In fact, the questionnaire is thought for um, teenagers, and it asks questions like, did you smoke before lunch? And, or did you ever have a fight because cannabis? Or do you have uh, like 
thinkings or voices in your head that you don't know where they come from. So if people just check two of those th th uh, six questions, this is diagnosed like uh, abuse of cannabis or risk of abuse or... So what we have seen is that those indicators are not really scientific or evidence-based. It's more like uh, it carries this stigma and maybe with other social issues it, they wouldn't be applied, but there's a still uh, this uh, background on all the sociosanitary uh, system, what my colleague commented before, no, with women who are pregnancy have test positive to cannabis. So there are many of these protocols and hidden indicators or questionnaires that are still validating those risks or overrating those risks. So it's a very complex issue because you have to deconstruct all these um, protocols and uh, questionnaires that have been um, going on for years and years and it's t totally BS. It, no? So this is uh, one of the other um, motivations. Just to add to that, to the um, way that we diagnose cannabis use disorder with the DSM-5, so what psychiatrists, psychologists use, uh, those criteria, of course, um, are very easy to uh, be positive for as well. So things like, did it take you a lot of time and energy to get your cannabis? Um, did you need to increase your dose of cannabis? Things like that are what are being used to determine if someone has a cannabis use disorder. So again, not very representative of an actual problem. Yeah, and it seems to me that the word addiction has, like the speech, as you say, Oscar, the discourse, the, the, the word addiction has an original sin because a, the prefix a in the, in the word addiction, it means without. And diction from Latin, it means hablar, to speak. Addiction is without speak. So... Is, is, a, is a pretension of the medical science or medical discipline to s sign that addict that uh, it has no power of the world. So it's a very political thing, you know? Uh, and another question for Dr. Oliver. Very interesting. I, I found it very interesting. Uh, um, in, in your professional practice, do you work with cannabis and your patients, right? Non, je ne peux pas utiliser le cannabis. En France, les médecins n'ont pas de spécialité pharmaceutique disponible. do not have uh, the facilities to do it. And if I do it, it's not officially. I mean, I, I cannot really talk about it. But uh, we do medical support and uh, with no association. And about five times a week, we have patients who call us and ask questions about the pathology, uh, side effects, interactions of cannabis, and therefore. Uh, we uh, uh, look through the scientific literature and try to, to inform those patients. So, so the, the question is, in France, it's not allowed to use marijuana for, for part of the physicians. Um. It's authorized, but there is no access to the product. We have marinol, yes, with the, the, the temporary authorizations under strong restrictions. Only 330 patients have had access to marinol since 2001, so it's not a lot every year. And there's another medication, Satilex, that's available, but there has been no contribution regarding that, and the, it was judged that it was ineffective enough to be refunded by social security, and therefore it's not really used. Okay, thanks. Just... Just, une précision, Just uh, one more detail. France, uh, things are moving in France. C est, c est, c est <laughs> and there is a scientific uh, committee that uh, specialized in those questions of medical cannabis and the relevance of, um, of cannabis in medicine has been recognized by the authorities, uh, at least uh, by uh, the, 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 that committee. And therefore, today, uh, the people are reflecting upon the possibilities of access during six months, this thing will be looked at and to see what 
we can do before 2020. Okay, to, to Michel, we all know that in Canada you legalized the cannabis since 17 October, October 17, no? With, I congratulate you, and I think all of you think about with a, a clap, yeah? <laughs> no, but the question is this. I believe in Canada, the, the physicians are prescribing cannabis, no? About 7,000 of, of, of the physicians are working. The question is, how, uh, what kind of arguments, uh, what kind of speeches have the medical community uh, put in game? In the for the for the part of the pro cannabis physicians and for the other part, if you can make a resume. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, the official statements coming from physician groups in Canada and um, has been very negative against cannabis, um, and there's been some concern that with a recreational or non medical market that um, people that truly are using cannabis for medical purposes may now be um, limited because physicians can kind of say, well, you don't have to go through me anymore. You can just go purchase it. Um, so, yeah, I would say that I don't, I don't know that, that I've seen that legalization has changed um, in a positive way the way that it's being treated medically in Canada, um, except for that people that were limited before because they couldn't access a physician, the physician was, you know, this gatekeeper, they can now um, access it legally. Okay, because in my experience, a lot of people came to take your door saying, listen, doctor, I use marijuana and I want to be more safe with my plants in, my, in the backyard, you know. Or, and one as a doctor, you, you are in a, in a moral dilemma here because you just... Uh, prescribe the, the, the other uh, medicines for, for people that it, are ill or with a pain or, you know, some disease. In this case, uh, to prescribe uh, cannabis at these people is, is a measure of harm reduction, I believe, because otherwise these people run the risk of being uh, condemned for minor offenses to the drug law. So I don't know if you are agree with me. I, I would like to, to listen your opinion, please. Well, it's quite interesting, actually. We, did a, we surveyed medical students across Canada, and it, we're, we haven't published it yet, um, but we found that the curriculum for cannabis uh, still it hasn't been added to any sort of medical school curriculum that students were reporting less than two hours in their whole medical degree. So in some ways, it, it makes a lot of sense that a doctor wouldn't be willing to prescribe it if that isn't um, what they've been taught about um, it, when you're dedicating so many more hours to other medications. So, um, yeah, it's really unfortunate. Oui, en, en France, sur les 9 ans de cursus, c'est 10 minutes qui sont consacrées au cannabis. And Ça, 10 juste minutes. Pour uh, les faits, uh, uh, just list, uh, used to list the damages due to cannabis. <laughs> Ten minutes in nine years. <laughs> okay. Uh, they also, uh, yes, um, we are going to give you the, the, the word now, please, with uh, questions. Hi. Uh, this may be a stupid question, but uh, listening to Raphael Machulam talking about history of cannabis, and its treatment of epilepsy. Uh, he often talks about a Muslim physician treating uh, patients of epilepsy, a child who, and then refers, the physician refers the child was dependent on cannabis for the rest of his life, and he was an epilepsy patient. And so my question is, what is so wrong on being dependent on cannabis? Is, I mean, does that cause significant problems in a personal life that it should be forbidden? <laughs> Je pense que si ça soigne, on ne peut plus vraiment parler de dépendance. Hein. On parle de posologie et c'est un traitement. They call that dependency, but it's posology, it's a treatment. And people are treated for diabetes, for uh, other problems. They, they take pills every day for their whole life. 
And so if with the CBD, you can uh, just uh, stop using uh, uh, specialized me medicines that have lots of side effects on the liver, for instance, well, you can't really say that it's a problem. And the child will then be dependent because he doesn't want to have any convulsions. But, but that's all there is about that then. Okay, another question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, about saying for uh, sustainable uses and delivery methods, are we supposed to uh, have uh, some uh, uh, approach to the patients according to the uh, experience to use cannabis? Because of majority of the patients, unfortunately, has, uh, have such wrong uh, experience using cannabis for the direct smoking. And now we are challenging because of this uh, 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 wrong perception that uh, uh, make me uh, as, a, uh, as a physician to a very difficult job to explain to other physicians that we prescribe cannabis or recommend cannabis to use cannabis. But the better delivery methods should be non-direct smoking. Uh, so uh, other method of delivery of cannabis using uh, modern inhalators, uh, using suppository, edibles, etc., etc., less uh, as a, a most effective and less harmful way to use cannabis. And I uh, would like to ask you if you have uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, products available in your countries, because in Israel, for example, we fully legalized cannabis for medical purposes, but unfortunately our, our Minister of Health reduced from this uh, uh, list uh, edibles and, uh, and suppositoria, because saying that bioavailability is so uh, uncertain. So uh, we need to insist to have all uh, available de delivery methods uh, available in country where the legal medical cannabis is available. So, uh, and uh, I would like to, to ask your experience if it's available in your countries. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of deliverables and but information because in Spain, for example, we have like thousand clubs and those clubs are serving to, to patients and those clubs have many types of presentations of cannabis, but uh, there's no good quality control and there's not a good uh, therapeutic um, process with doctors. So you can have the products, but if you don't have the information and the, the training for the physicians or the staff, it's not also, I mean, it's many, many variables, no? not only one that we have to promote and, and regulate. All right, the last one. Ah, Dr. Franjo has also. Um, so my thing is, is that I believe um, that the medical doctors, they are actually a little bit um, scared, especially about the safety and efficacy of cannabis. Um, be because we, we have a special um, situation here that we, I think we all agree that cannabis has been used for the last 5,000 years, but um, that, that's true for the herbal preparation, for example. Like, uh, people didn't really use uh, critical CO2 extractions, all this stuff, or they didn't use, um, like, just a fraction of whatever extract they did, or... Um, also, the enriched extracts, it's, it doesn't really have anything to do with um, the natural compound anymore, maybe. And um, I, I think this is the real problem. Nobody really knows yet how the cannabis exactly works, like what each compound is good for. Um, they are just starting to um, prescribe it already. And um, re regarding the... The, the, the safety, I mean, it's also a question, you know, if, if, you, if you change one molecule in uh, serotonin and then you have psilocybin, for example, it's a totally different result that it's doing for your brain. And um, we, we have seen with synthetic cannabinoids also that um, they, they can end deadly, you know. Uh, so I, 
I, I do, in fact, understand a little bit the physicians because they also have a little bit of responsibility. And, um, you know, also most of the patients, they're just not only on cannabis, they're also using a multitude of, of different um, other medications already. And this is something that nobody really knows, the, the drug-drug interaction. And, um, you know, if, if, for example, the, <coughs> the, the cannabis is um, broken down, from the same enzymes that, for example, an opioid is broken down, that it can, in, in fact, happen that the level of opioids in the blood is rising, you know, and um, and so the, the, even if, if this would not be, um, let's say, diagnosed as a, as a cannabis overdose, it might still have something to do with it. Luckily, we know from, from the states where um, cannabis was actually legalized is that the uh, opioid death went down, not up. And so, um, but the thing is, is that the, the, the clinical di data are really lacking at this point. And I think, um, yeah, that there's uh, a, a lot that has to be done still. No. Yeah, is it possible? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, uh, my name is Franjo Grotenham. I come from, from Germany. Um, I have to, would like to contribute a small anecdote because uh, we see somebody from France and somebody from Canada, and physicians look on cannabis very different. Despite we have shared the same medical journals and everything. And um, I, I read German, of course. I read English, I read French. And um, I detected um, a disease which is mainly found in France. It is cannabis arteritis. It doesn't nearly exist in other countries, but in France, and mainly in France scientific journals. So, uh, cannabis arteritis is so seen to be similar to thrombangitis obliterans or Burgess disease, which is an, a disease of uh, uh, the arteries, uh, going to uh, making occlude them, and uh, may lead to amputation. And this disease was invented by Gabriel Nazar Nahas, a French scientist, and I say, I say event, invent, because I, I, I was very curious, by, why does this disease exist only in France? And I did a, a review on all cases of so-called cannabis arteritis, and it were about 61 or 62 um, cases, and I realized that only in one case there was cannabis use only. The others use also tobacco. And uh, for tobacco, it's well known that there is this kind of disease. And uh, since the persons also use cannabis, then said, okay, so this may be cannabis arteritis. So um, I did the publication in 2010, the review. I detailed review and analyzed every case. And I came to the conclusion that I questioned if there is really cannabis arteritis. And since 2010, there's no another case report. Uh, so uh, this is, but it, it, it may have feared uh, French physicians that such a severe disease may exist caused by cannabis, which is not known in the USA or Canada. And not, there was one German article on possible cannabis arteritis. I called the, the researcher who did this and said, so, do you really think that it was caused by cannabis? No, I'm not so sure. It maybe have been tobacco, but it may have been cannabis arteritis. So uh, people may also invent diseases uh, to increase the fear from cannabis because prohibition is living from fear. Yeah. So I hope, right. I don't know if cannabis arteritis does really exist. Uh, I don't think so, but... Uh, yeah, that may explain some differences between Canada and France. It's very difficult to live in France and to deal with cannabis on a rational basis. I, I know this because, uh, well, I sometimes make the joke and read uh, French articles, scientific articles on cannabis. Thank you. All right.
right. Uh, I ask Dr. Oliver if you want to say something. Uh, effectivement, uh, je, 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 je suis d'accord avec vous. Uh, yes, I agree uh, with you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Norman. Uh, France is, 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 is quite good at uh, inventing illnesses. And recently, they invented the deathly uh, cannabis because there will be death by infarctus that will be caused by cannabis. And when we look at how they came to such result, which is rather striking, then we notice that it's retrospective. When uh, death is established, if you see that that person has used cannabis, it is uh, regarded as a causing factor and it will be sold as such by the media. And the scientists say uh, there the, 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 the may be a correlation, but nothing has been proved. But in the media, that's what then they, they, they say. And uh, therefore, cannabis is now a, a deadly produce. OK. Uh, I believe we are right on time. Uh, respect to the 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 question over there, the lady, if, if I understand well, I, I will say that no overdose of cannabis have, has been demonstrated, as Dr. Grotting-Herman just said. In, the medic, in my medical practice, almost the, the collateral effects, the, adver the adversal effects are less dizziness or somnolence, or just... Uh, maybe increase of uh, appetite, but uh, no, no an, another um, adverse effects have I see. Um, I, I hope there, there will no more, because you know that these receptors of for cannabinoids are not in the, in the, in the respiratory center, in the, in the bulbo. I don't know the English word for bulbo raquidio, <laughs> sorry, but, uh, uh, yep, I believe we're right, so I give you a very big clap, clapping for these people who has uh, moving and traveling around the world to be here.